Bismillahirrahmanirrahim and welcome to another uh, Tabad Lab live conversation. We're really lucky today to be joined by Stefan Durkan. Uh, Stefan is the former chief economist uh, for the UK aid or the international aid uh, ministry of the British government, which is now, of course, merged with its foreign ministry. Uh, and maybe I might ask uh, Stefan to talk about a little bit about that as well. It just it just occurred that that's a fascinating uh, topic of conversation for somebody that has written, I think, one of the runaway sort of uh, books, uh, successful books on trying to understand how countries move from being not so successful economically to being successful economically. It's called Gambling on Development. And it really, the core thesis is about countries succeeding when their elites establish a sustainable bargain. There's an equation within which everybody operates and, and countries are run by their elites. And that's the basic thesis. I would strongly recommend that uh, if you can get, a, get your hands on a copy, uh, get your hands on it. Uh, but part of today's conversation, we'll be going through some elements of the book, but also to ask Stefan about his impressions of Pakistan. Uh, he's been in country uh, for a few days. He will remain in Pakistan for a few days. He's attending a very important conference being hosted by the World Bank uh, offices in Pakistan and co-hosted by the Pakistan Institute for Development Economics. Uh, Professor Stefan Durkan, welcome to Tabad Lab and thank you for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm so happy that we've gotten a chance to talk a, a couple of times already. Um, and, uh, you know, I there's one sort of thing that has really jumped at me in your in your book and in your writings and your speeches, and that is that you have identified in many countries these, um, we, you know, in our culture there's something called a baba, and a baba is like an elder, right? These policy babas who stay in post for a long time. They're not the guys that are in charge. They're not the decision makers, but they are like technically really robust and they somehow manage to survive through different changes in government and uh, different policies even, but they stick it through. And your argument, it seems to me, is that when you have those kinds of babas in posts, for example, somebody stays at the central bank for 20 years or somebody stays at the investment uh, you know, commission or corporation for like 11 years. Those long-term posts, that is one facet of these countries that manage to succeed. I guess my big question is, that's quite counterintuitive to corporate governance and, you know, everybody should be in post for like three years or five years and then you should have new leadership. You don't want people abusing their power. You don't want staleness. You don't want boomers to keep acting like it's 1965. You want Gen X. This is a country with a very young population. So how do I reconcile the sense of what you're, it's very sensible what you're saying, but I live in a country with a median age of 23. I promised you I wouldn't ask long questions and we're already going at I don't know how many minutes. But, but help us through this dilemma, uh, Stefan. So, so let's, take, let's answer this in two steps. So the first one is you've alluded to. It's a bit like in the way I like to think about countries that have been successful. Countries that have been successful tends to be amongst the elite, the big players that matter, that is you know, not just the government, it can be the military, it, it is definitely the senior civil service, it's often intellectuals, journalists, maybe think tanks. There is somehow an underlying shared commitment to try to grow the pie, okay? There's lots of other features to it, you know, some of these successful countries that are looking in the book, they include the Indonesias, they include China, they include Bangladesh, Ghana. These are also countries where, you know, the elite captures bits of rents and there is elite capture happening in bits and pieces but somehow there is a commitment to try to grow the pie and that actually links then to this point that you're actually making it's very striking that in some of these countries at least they were helped by actually having a number of trusted people whose incentives objectives his personal objectives were aligned with this and who were trusted to keep on advising and supporting the government to see this through. So you get these babas, I like it very much as the, as the idea of it, this kind of almost fatherly figures that actually can, can actually guide you. They can criticize, if necessary, the leadership. They are there to see the errors and help with the correction and so on. And so indeed, I, I talk in the book about 
figures like that in, in Ethiopia, figures like that in Uganda, where it was very striking, a governor of the central bank. He used to be the finance minister. You know, he was one of the few people who actually can tell the president off. He passed away not so long ago, but he was someone who could actually say to the president, who has quite a lot of powers, and he could even go public and say, mm, this doesn't sound like a good idea. So this, this guy was challenging Museveni. Exactly. And so in a sense, he was challenging Museveni at times, mostly behind closed doors, a few times publicly, and so on. But they were trusted because they had the right intention. You know, they were a bit like the guardians of the underlying commitments and were willing to be the ones that, that helped to see this through. This is, of course, the point. In countries that don't seem to have this longer term tool of commitment, of course, you don't have these figures <laughs> because you, know, you don't have the commitment. So you kind of, no, you have a very short term horizon in many places. You just want to capture the rents and the benefits. What's the point of having someone who wants to keep on reminding me of the longer term vision? So the order is have the commitment and then you can probably use people like that. And you know what's fascinating is you said we don't have the Babas and actually we do have the Babas, not just the Babas, we have the... Uh, I think, you know, I'm trying to find a gender neutral term, but I, we can say the Babas and the, and, and the Maas, the, the mother, the policy moms, right? Um, so to, to name one, in foreign policy and security, we have this really incredible woman. Her name is uh, Malia Lodi, and she's been Pakistan's ambassador to the U.S., to the United Nations, to the U.K. She understands global affairs in a way that very few people do. We have a guy, I, I'm sure you know this name. I also know that you know the name Ishrat Hussain, who was our former state bank governor for five, uh, for five years to begin with, and then another five-year term, but then, uh, you know, then he, you know, um, or was it three and three? But, it, you know, he's, he's kind of, we have this great asset. Another one is Sirtaj Aziz, another name that I know you're familiar with. Uh, and he was Minister of Finance, Minister of Foreign Affairs. But over the last 30 years, these three individuals, at any given point in time, their longest tenure, I don't think has been more than three or four years. And their tenures have been in different governments with different leaders, different regimes. Uh, and they know the answers. The answers that were that were viable in 1995, uh, you know, when they were already in, in senior positions, and the answers that are going to be viable in 2025, it's almost the same answers. And yet, because there's no, that underlying commitment that you highlighted, because of the absence of the underlying commitment, we have all this talent that's kind of wasted. Do you see this in other countries, or are we truly unique? No, no. Exceptional, Pakistani exceptionalism doesn't apply. You know, you're not an exception. Okay. It's a quite a common phenomenon. And it's, you know, it, and it goes indeed these two ways. And I should also be clear, you know, there are good arguments, what you also mentioned earlier, that in some of these formal positions, like a governor of a central bank or something, that you have turnover in these positions as well. But actually, these figures that I described, they're not necessarily all the time in one position. Sure. Like the person that I was in Tanzania, very, very influential, Ben Ndulu, he was, he was a governor of the central bank. He was actually, for a while, actually had worked in the World Bank as well. He had worked in other institutions. He worked just as an advisor, the kind of thing. The main thing is that there are people within the underlying elite, not necessarily one person, one president or whatever, or one prime minister, but within the elite, this voice is trusted and they are entrusted with advice and they're listened to. So you have very talented people, yeah. but you know, the, the whole game in town is not necessarily value in talented people that will grow the pie because the game in town is not necessarily try to grow the pie. The, the, maybe some of the smartest people are actually entrusted to play the game of the rents that exist and distributed to the right kind of players. So in other countries, we have similar things. People that are smart, that, can, um, that are actually very good, but they're not entrusted with the task of actually growing the pie and do the necessary thing. They're more entrusted. I know I'm only for three years in power. Uh, then, some, then I may well be kicked out. Help me to grab what I can for the people that supported me to get into the office and are distributed. I can name you quite a few countries around the world that are looking like that. And we may have, we may be in one where there is an element of this going on. I find this fascinating. Of course, I'm in no position to kind of have a theory when I'm sitting with, with a luminary like yourself. But that's been my working theory of why our talent is unable to either stick it out or to affect change is because 
the incentives for anybody in a position of influence are different here than they are in Indonesia or China or India because their incentives are shaped by that short-termism. And it's not that they're ill-intentioned or that there's any, I think there's not even a foundational moral or ethical issue there. You can only behave well within the constraints of the ecosystem that you exist in. And so we'll never get that kind of a leader, policy leader, because we don't have the ecosystem to support it. So let's talk a little bit about those ecosystems. My favorite chapter in your book, and frankly, the one that I've read more carefully than the rest of it, because I've flipped through a lot of it, but I was fascinated that you chose to have a chapter called, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the dragon, the tiger cub, and the peacock. And I love that formulation. And of course, uh, you know, for our viewers who haven't uh, read the book, uh, Stefan is talking about the Chinese miracle, and he dedicates most of the chapter to China, but then he also treats uh, both uh, Indonesia, which is the tiger cub, and uh, India, which is the peacock. Uh, and there's a really great box in the, in the chapter on Vietnam, which, which I really appreciated. Um, and I was thinking of the right sort of parallel for Pakistan, and it could be both animals are endangered, which I think is a good uh, sort of parable. Uh, one is the snow leopard, and the other one is the Indus dolphin. Um, uh, you know, kind of at risk of being extinct, but but capable of moving very swiftly if things sort of start to work out. Maybe walk us a little bit through this chapter and explain what the kind of thesis that comes out of all three countries is, and then I'll try and test you and challenge you maybe on a few things, especially in Indonesia. Yes. So, okay, so look, if the underlying thesis is that countries progress when somehow the leading groups, the elite players, somehow amongst them a dominant coalition emerges where they change their incentives from largely kind of a zero-sum game where whoever is in power tries to grab what there is to a much more situation where you actually say, well, actually I'm going to try to grow the pie even within the imperfection where there will be still rent distribution, there will still be corruption, whatever, but our incentives get aligned with the growing of the pie. And so in the chapter, I tell the story a bit on both on, on all these countries, how it came about and how is it reflected. Because why, why on purpose did the chapter where three very different countries, you know, China, Indonesia and India, very different in all kinds of features, when they made the changes, how they did it, you know, and the underlying thing. You know, they're very different in their histories, the institutional history, very different in their political system during the periods of change. They're also very different in actually how they did it, what the measures were uh, to do it. And so I want to emphasize in this diversity, there's a common element. So let's start with China, that actually people tend to know best. Everybody knows 1979, Deng Xiaoping, the, the great reformer. And sometimes said, okay, this is the Communist Party of China, so clearly there's an autocrat and he suddenly decides, I'm going to do something different. Now that's of course a totally misreading of what happened in China. It's first of all, we have to remember, you know, this is some years after, not that long after Mao's death. It meant the Cultural Revolution had happened, of course, total stagnation in the economy, deep crisis actually in the economy, desperately poor country, something like 80 to 90% of the population would be classified with current, yeah, with current World Bank definitions as in living in extreme poverty. Uh, you know, deeply problematic, and with political turmoil, because there's a succession battle going on, including the Gang of Four, which is, was led by Mao's widow. Now, within this, there are people then saying, oh my God, we are, we are the elite. The Communist Party of China is the elite. It's almost by equation, it's the elite. And people saying, look, we want this elite to survive. We want the party to survive. How are we going to do this? And what Deng Xiaoping and other reformers did and said, we need to regain legitimacy in this country to actually delivering to people, because otherwise, from below, the pressure will be such and will disappear. And so they do it for food security and growth. And in the way to understand it is that Deng Xiaoping had to first, actually the party, the country itself is not democratic, but the party is actually quite democratic. He needed to convince enough different players within the party that they could get the power to do the reforms. So he builds a coalition in the, in, in the elite to actually do this. So this is China. They changed their underlying commitment from being 
totally subject economic policies to ideology to actually policies that are pragmatic. It doesn't matter whether the cat is white or black, yeah. as long as it catches mice. Pragmatic economic policies to try to grow, but actually to, to sustain what they have. But it's a change. It not The measures itself are very different from what other countries did, but the underlying commitment we're going to try to succeed in growth and development are central. I, I was going to say it's almost uh, another parallel would be the objective of policy was not to be adherent to communism, but to be adherent to outcomes for the Chinese people. Exactly. Uh, or maybe a different way of putting it is, you know, you can turn to Mecca, you can turn to Jerusalem, you can turn to the Vatican, but ultimately the job is to get to God. Yes. And, and so... And the, uh, and the reason why they did it was not deeply benign. The first reason was to survive, to survive as the party, as an elite. So this is, this is part of it, you know, it's not just benignness, and I don't think any of these countries, it's entirely because, oh, I suddenly saw the light and I'm going to serve. The yeah, there's no such thing as a benevolent elite. Exactly, okay. there never is that. And then go to Indonesia, this is then a great example of it. And I will be a bit shorter, but actually, you know, a lot of people date it quite a bit later, but I would date it in the early 1970s, when Suharto, the military leader. So not 1998. Not 1998, definitely not 1990. Okay, great. So we have a big disagreement, but exactly. please, please. But, but, but 1998 is fascinating, and I will argue with you on, on that point in a moment. But just briefly saying is that, you know, what you need to know from Indonesian history is a lot of conflict in the countryside in the 1960s. Sure. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed, supposedly in a war against communism, but really brutal. So the army which comes to power by, uh, by the end, by late 1960s, I think 60, 66, 67. Yeah, well, the, the, is, is the, the conflict, to yeah, the con yeah, okay, so, so, and then the conflict, the, the, the deep point in all the conflict countryside is 1966, and so you get this transition, so initially it's a little bit, the power is not formally consolidated, so to speak, but the army comes to power. You can immediately see from the countryside and from the large proportion of the population, you know, they don't give legitimacy to this new leader. They may have power, but my God, they were awful. So there's nothing there. And so there's a real sense, you know, well, how is Suharto going to deal with all these pressures from below? The problem is with Suharto, he also has pressures from above because he got rid of an incredibly popular leader, uh, national, the, the nationalist leader, the independence hero, Sukarno, which was clearly the representative of all the families the elite families that captured power after independence in all the big family businesses and all the kind of the kind of houses. So there is Suharto, what he needs to do. Well, actually Suharto wants to survive. It's again that. How do I survive? And he does two things. He knows that to deliver to the people, he needs to get his economy to grow. This is desperately poor and he chooses to, to deliver to the people to doing the growth. He does something dramatic. And it includes, one dramatic thing includes inviting Japanese investment. You know, we're not that long after the war, a very brutal occupation. He gets Japanese investors in. Wow, what he, what he is doing it. And they actually were allowed to come in to surprise the Japanese even and build up the industrial parks and basically start a whole industrial revolution in, in Indonesia. And they haven't looked back on that side. But then the nationalist elite, of course, hates that he does. So, so Karno, quote unquote, has to buy them off. How does he buy them off? Well, he, he allows them to keep some of their power, especially in some of the, the, the state holding companies like Petromina, the oil company, very corrupt organization. He condones some of the corruption, if only to be able to forge this. They haven't looked back. And I think it's in that period because actually the growth starts picking up. He brings in experts, we talked about it, in fact, they called them the Berkeley boys yeah. in, uh, in Indonesia. So, uh, you know, he had Chile, sometimes people remember the Chicago boys, but these were the Berkeley boys. And they advise all the time when Sukarno, uh, when Suharto, when the you know, macroeconomic crisis happens and IMF and others need to be occasionally called in, how shall we handle this? How shall we turn this into growth as well? And so on. And very effectively, through a whole series of macro crises, they are there helping. So this is, a very different way of, 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 of a transition in a very different country. And the choice, maybe as a final point before you interrupt, the choice is very different from China. China went for state-led development. 
That's not what Indonesia did. In fact, Indonesia, they stepped back. And it's actually fascinating. Indonesia as a state, state capability was far weaker. This was going to be my question. Yes, please do. In China, how did state capability emerge in China? And, and why was Indonesia able to build itself up so successfully despite some very profound governance gaps in the late 80s and certainly in the 90s with sure. Mrs. 10%. You know, Pakistanis think they, they own the 10% moniker, but before it was given to Asif Ali Zardari, it belonged to the wife of, of course, yes. President Suharto. Yes, exactly. The wife of, uh, of Suharto, it, she, her first name was Tien. And in Dutch, you know, the old colonial language, Tien is actually Ten. And so that's why they call her Madame, T uh, Madame Tien, Madame T Ten Percent. Right. Uh, of obviously all the infrastructure contracts. But so the state capability question is an interesting one. You know, and um, before I answer it, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, look, if, if I ever, you know, if I ever were dropped from another planet on Earth and I said, I want to do state-led development, which country shall I pick? I probably would have picked either Japan, Korea or, or China. And why is that? These are states with 2,000 years of centralized authority. 2,000 years of centralized taxation system. 2,000 years of meritocratic bureaucracy that get appointed through state exams. So if I'm going to state -led, do state-led development, a big role of the state, that's these, are where the, you these, start. these are the places I start. Professor Ilhan Niaz in Pakistan makes a similar argument. Oh, please continue. Yes, and, it's, and it's, it's an important point because virtually no country in the world beyond the few that I've mentioned has that same history of a long state that is strong. So you come to Indonesia, there the state had to be built out after the colonial times. It was built up, maybe there's a parallel here or a people, the illusion how, how it was built up in Pakistan. You know, you end up building it partly by rewarding those people who were loyal to you in the independence struggle and who chose the right side. You actually do it as reward and you get into the habit that being appointed in the state is a reward for loyalty. A business contract is a, a reward for loyalty. Now, it means you have very low state capability. Now, this is the amazing thing that Indonesia did. And by the way, a, a, a nearer country like Bangladesh did the same, and I'll come to India maybe in a second, but Bangladesh as well, you recognize that you don't have the state capability. So your success comes from being aware enough that you need to step back. So you choose a model that fits you. It means you may not be able to deliver to people as much as you would like to, but it's the only way you will make the progress, stepping back. A very different choice. India, interestingly, the pride of India, the peacock there, you know, and I use that allusion to India, and there's a little bit of, you know, uh, as a bird, Pakistan likes the peacock as well. You know, it's beautiful and showcase itself beautifully with beautiful feathers. But actually, if you strip away the feathers, it's a really tiny bird. You really wonder, oh my God, is that all that the skeleton has here are the bases. So India is a similar kind of thing of very weak foundations, big talk, um, but actually doesn't have it. How did it really then in the end, in a fascinating way, manage to kickstart growth? is by going away from the model they had developed, you know, they talk it, you know, the, the, the license Raj, the state. The Nehruvian right? state. Exactly. The, where the, the Hindu rate of growth, yeah, so to speak. The Hindu speak. rate of yeah. growth. They often talk about the license Raj, where the state would be the master and controller of everything and it was going to do everything. Of course, it has none of that capability and the incentives are wrong. And yet today, the Hindu rate of growth is 10%, yes. not one and a half. Well, and that is then comes back to it, what is then the turning point in that is 1991, where actually a, a bunch of, of leading thinkers, Manman Singh, one of them, actually quite across different parties, recognized that actually, look, if we want to make, for, make progress, we'll have to step back as a state. And we have to liberalize and actually get the foundations first of the macroeconomy and then broader of the economy as a whole there. The, the supply response was dramatic in India. You know, the growth rate, as you say, it's a massive one. It's been sustained. It's the same state, yeah. but actually it stepped back, not massively, just about enough. And wow, the unleashing of the forces are amazing. But since 1991, it's never had to go back to the IMF. Yeah. 
it's never had to really worry about this balance of payments in a deep fundamental way. It, of course, has to do its corrections. It has learned to actually say, look, let's get the basics right. And meanwhile, there is a general perception amongst all political parties, the game in town, yes, it's a little bit rewarding our supporters, but it has to be in terms of growth. And here, the politics of the 1990s, I think, is fascinating. Everybody says it's 1991. People forget it was a minority government. Yes. They didn't have a majority. The left, who was agitating on the street against the IMF program, whatever. And at that time was still quite strong in West Bengal. Exactly, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, but the left was agitating. But when it came to the vote, you remember, it's a minority government. The opposition could have united and voted it down. The left walked out of parliament. They actually took their responsibility by walking out of parliament so that the majority was much fewer votes. The BJP was against it at the time. By the late 1990s, it was campaigning on the economy. Modi is always campaigning on the economy. Yeah. It becomes the common thing and say, look, there's an implicit red line in the way we do politics that we all need to try to grow the economy. And that's a key performance indicator that we must have. And so, so it's a very striking underlying deep commitment into this growth. And the actions are commensurate to it. It's not just words. Politics, you know, they are, they have withdrawn out of all kinds of uh, bits and pieces of the economy, given away the control. Rents are still there, but it's from a much larger pie. And basically this kind of state that is just a zero-sum game. If I'm in power, I line my pockets. If I'm not in power, I agitate to try to get the other one out again. Actually is being replaced by, yes, a lot of political contestation, but actually not so much about the economy. So this rent top, there's so many different directions I could go, and I'm so sorry that we don't have two days to spend together and maybe undo our ties and really get into it. But, but there's a couple of things around rents that I would be really interested in. Um, I noticed that, like me, you have a, uh, you have a liking for Jagdish Bhagwati. Uh, for me, because, uh, you know, when I was much younger and I was coming out of school, his work on reverse migration was really fascinating. And that's when I was freshly coming out of school. And uh, he, I, I don't know where he is now, but he used to be at Columbia. I'm assuming he still is or um, he, yeah, of course um, he, uh, but he's one of the giants, I think of our era in terms of economics. He has a term that you referenced in this chapter called directly unproductive activities. And I found it fascinating because the three countries you mentioned, I make this case often in Pakistan to a lot of derision. And, and the derision is understandable. Uh, it doesn't phase me, but, but, but I understand where it's coming from. And my case is that when Pakistanis complain about rent seeking and corruption, I want Pakistanis to focus on Turkey, Indonesia, China, Bangladesh, and India. And my argument is these are all countries that are possibly more corrupt where there is more uh, what Jagdish Bhagwati calls directly unpredictive activity. And yet it hasn't stopped those countries from growing at a rapid rate. So what is the, like, is there a good version of this and a bad version of it? Or how does it get contained and not eat up the, the economic growth of a country? Look, so first of all, you know, as a, you know, I, I like level playing fields. And of course, any form of corruption is a distortion in the economy. But I'm realistic enough that sometimes for the kind of underlying political equilibria, you know, rent distribution is part of politics, yeah. you know, rewarding your supporters and so on. Now, the interesting thing with these countries and where the change happens is that a recognition comes that, um, you know, despite the corruption, you know, we, we, we leave space and we, for example, we make sure that some of the rents we get, things get invested. Yeah. And there's actually an investment response, you know? Yeah, maybe the firm didn't really pay its taxes, but actually the capital stays here and it actually is accumulating. And that has to come back to somehow implicit set of both norms and behaviors, as well as incentives in and the country. And some stability, to right? Exactly. Knowing and that you're not gonna get thrown in jail tomorrow. You know. Well, yeah. Okay, so, so knowing that you're not going to be thrown in jail for a bad reason, I, I still think you should be a little bit afraid that you're going to be thrown in jail for, for the corruption activity, but, but not for the kind of political persecution in the, that is often uh, used 
And then corruption is used as a way of actually getting rid of your political enemies. Right. So, so there is a clarity also in these kind of policies around it. And so, so what I'm not a fan of, and some people, sometimes even commentators in Pakistan, will comment on it and say, oh, it's just about oiling the wheels of the system. We need a bit of corruption. That's important. It's the grease, you know? Uh -huh. It's not a thing. I understand, just as I alluded to in Indonesia, that actually it's an interesting thing. If, if, if we had all encouraged to act and say, oh no, get rid of all these old families controlling the, these, these enterprises because they're corrupt, he probably would have been out of power in a year. So you have to understand, exactly, you understand somehow that it can be part of the equilibrium. I'm not going to condone it. And so where the difference is, is that cor uh, corruption that is there in the system, I think we should keep on fighting it, but it's not, the cause of why it goes wrong. The cause of why it goes wrong is the lack of the underlying incentives to growth, the arbitrariness of the anti-corruption and related policies, and the kind of underlying sense that, wow, if I have capital, this is a good place to invest it in. You know, there is, there is um, actually think of in Bangladesh, actually there's most of the investment in the governments industry comes from domestic capital and it keeps on growing and growing and growing. These people are not putting their money in Dubai, they're putting their money in their own economy. But so the it's not like that these 1500 sort of magical families in Bangladesh are not. There is corruption in that ecosystem yes. and, and quite a lot of it. And yet it is the money, I think quite rightly, the money stays at home. And so it's re being reinvested at home. Of course, nobody condones corruption. I guess my question if I was to switch from Bangladesh maybe to a little bit about Nigeria and Ethiopia, because yeah. we had very strong anti-corruption narratives, a lot of them financed and, and pushed by Western institutions. Yeah. Uh, many of our colleagues, I, I used to you know, work for DFID as well prior to you joining it, so a little bit further back. And you would remember Hillary Benn yes. kind of pulling the plug on Ethiopia on corruption, essentially, yeah. right around the time the third white paper was being written. At that time, it was clear that, you know, corruption is not good, but the anti-corruption narrative that exists in a lot of these countries is essentially an instrument for political exp uh, exploitation or political victimization rather than for growing the economy. And that there are other things that grow the economy. And, and of course, uh, it shouldn't sort of include corruption, but if it does, I think like you're saying, um, maybe that's not entirely uh, the worst thing in the world. Yes, exactly. I mean, it can be part of, a, of an equilibrium of stability. And if it doesn't, you know, it's go back to the Bagwati line, you know, yes, the, the corruption itself may be directly unproductive, but it may be indirectly productive. Right. <laughs> if it's directly and indirectly totally destructive, destructive right. there. And so that's the interesting thing as you make the distinction, say, between Indonesia and Congo or Nigeria. So in Nigeria, the corruption becomes the game in town. It's almost close to a kleptocracy. So basically it comes down to, if I'm working for the state, I have a license to steal from everybody. And so basically you organize the state to make sure there is as many possible contacts points with business and with individuals, because each of these is a moment of extracting something else. Yeah? So if, uh, uh, if, I, uh, if, if in Nigeria, or let me give the nice numbers on the Congo and the Democratic Republic of Congo, if I want to export coffee, I need 45 stamps and seven signatures. There's no obvious reason beyond that you create opportunities for rent seeking. So you each have, of those 45 people that are putting the stamp exactly. are also, yeah. yeah. So it becomes totally unpredictable. Can I actually everything get it out? Because I can block it every moment with one of these authorities blocking it. You know, as in a funny sort of way in Indonesia, and again, I'm not going to condone Madame 10%, but if saying it's a percent, it's at least a fixed, fixed percentage. I can plan, make this part of my planning. It's pretty good. I think we see a big case of this now in Turkey over right. the last 10, 15 yeah, years, yeah. right? And you, and you know, get it. So you could say, look, the incentives, at least in the way the corruption is happening, is not totally destructive right. for any economic activity. And I think it's been willing to do it. So don't focus on it. And can I actually say something related to it? It's not just about Corruption, because the definition of corruption is typically an illegal activity. There's plenty of countries where what in some countries, in, in my judgment, would be abuse of procurement is totally illegal. Yeah. You know, that I can pick 
a supplier that I like if I'm a minister and I can go outside procure rules as long as I sign an executive order. Well, that's not corruption in some countries, and in other countries it is. So it is again about these behaviors in terms of do you do your actions to try to get as good out of the money and the investments you get, or are you just in a game in town that's all just about lining the, the pockets? But, but I would yeah. say also that if you don't have an underlying consensus, Stephen, exactly. then the likelihood of having destructive corruption as opposed to productive corruption is higher. You may still award a contract that is less ideal, but if you have an underlying consensus, it'll be within the framework of a bigger exactly arc that. and a bigger yeah, purpose. Yeah. It's exactly that. And it's, you know, it's interesting that you sent earlier the disagreement on Indonesia, but it's really interesting is that you know, in a, there was a massive disruption with the Asian crisis in 1997. And of course, Indonesia went down a lot and Suharto lost power and, and, you know, other forces came to power. What is actually very striking that in my view, the kind of underlying economic incentives didn't change, you know? The, the, yes, and so you actually kept that underlying commitment that even if the politics turned around, a totally different regime comes to power, but actually we keep this. So, you, so there is a consistency in that commitment, a longer term. And then in that environment, things like corruption, you know, they're damaging, but they're not destructive. They're not predatory. They're not undermined. Just on Indonesia, you know, I, I'd like to agitate a little further because there's one, uh, I mean, obviously to me, this military dominance of Indonesia and that transition is very important. But the other thing that doesn't get talked about in Indonesia, and I, I wonder if you agree, is that the other big difference between, for example, Nigeria and Indonesia or Pakistan and Indonesia is not just the military, although the military both in Nigeria and Pakistan remains very powerful. But the other difference is Indonesia, starting in 1998, then jumps on this very rapid decentralization train. And I wonder what, to what extent you think that was in for, in helping inform that growth, because it might line up with the whole thesis around the capable state. In China, you, you already had a very capable, decentralized system of governance. In Indonesia, maybe not so much. How, how do you... So, so I, I find it's, it's a bit like the same with corruption. I find it sometimes very hard to generalize about the decentralization. Huh? Because you could say in Nigeria or Basanjo in, uh, in the early 2000s, did also decentralization and the states got actually quite a lot of power and influence in it. So it's a bit like what you do with it. You know, here as well, you have the four provinces have considerable powers now and they can do it. Yeah, and, and, and it's always a bit like what you do with it, <laughs> what you do with it. And so in, again, in Indonesia, where in the end the incentives are aligned, where these things are done to solve genuine problems with reasonable incentives, like you refer to, and I'm totally happy, I take you, I do, I'm not an expert on that part of the Indonesian progress, but the kind of, I don't, I may bring the capability lower down, there's a better chance that I'd be responsive to the people. It's possibly a, a great way of acting. And that's it, is it? You know, we see that actually interesting in Kenya, where a constitutional reform, where you had winner-takes-all politics that was quite corrupt, where actually it became an answer to the corruption problem to some extent, or the dysfunctionality of the corruption, by actually saying, okay, if you don't win the center, you may win the state <laughs> or the province, and then actually it's not anymore total winner takes all because we have decentralized, you know, it's not simple. So you can make these things that, uh, that, that happening. But, but I like this idea, what you say is about decentralization as a, as a kind of overcoming some of the capability deficits. At the same time, you know, there's been plenty of work say on community-based development, that actually in lots of contexts this fails yeah. because you bring it down to the lowest level of capability. Yeah, and the risks of capture become closer when actually it is more visible what needs to be captured, you know, and so you get new layers of capture. So, so the, it's a, and there's a general theme in my book, if you think there's a magic bullet, there's one institutional reform, one political reform, one economic reform there, it's tough stuff because it is actually about collective action equilibrium. It's about alignment of interests and, and incentives, somehow being just about cooperative enough that you set the underlying incentives right to actually begin to progress. For me, and to, to finish on my part would be the optimism that I have is, and even for Pakistan where we feel like we're stuck, 
we feel like we're often in a zero-sum game, there is not that growing of the pie. Most countries that took off were five or ten years beforehand predicted to be total failures. So you got Indonesia, where Gunnar Myrdal was writing in the late 1960s, nothing will come from Indonesia. In the 1970s, it begins to change. You've got Mauritius, where James Mead, a Nobel Prize winner, in the early 1960s wrote as advice to the, the government preparing for the decolonization, predicted, don't have much hope for the economy, we're stuck forever, it's a high income income country now. These things will happen, we will get there. And I don't want to give up. And these kind of moments of deep economic and political crisis are, just as it was in China, Indonesia and India, are the moments when maybe these things will come together. So I actually want to finish here with a hopeful note. There is a possibility that this is actually at this moment, some of this consensus is quietly being built, all behind somewhere in, in bit of circles. And we could all play a part in it by conversing about it, the possibility is there. And I think we may well move on uh, from here in a very positive way. Uh, Stefan, on that note of optimism, I would say that the best thing I can say optimistically is that you kept saying before you finish and at the end, and of course that's for this conversation, but I hope that you'll be part of that story here in Pakistan and in continue engaging with us and maybe helping us as, as we go along. I do think there are great things in store for Pakistan if, if the elite gets together and decides enough is enough. Excellent. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it.